The title is Jesus Teaches About Greatness in the Kingdom of God. Last month, we took a look at uh, Jesus' instruction to the disciples from the book of Matthew where he established the church. He started laying the foundation for the church. And in case you haven't noticed, we're going through the book of Matthew on a monthly basis, and we're focusing the um, sermons on the sermons in Matthew. Matthew pretty much put the gospel together, the gospel account that he he did, built around sermons that uh, that Jesus gave. And we've been doing that. And then some of the extra material and, you know, talking about what he did and actions and stuff like that relate to the main message. We're going to spend pretty much all our time in Matthew 17 and 18. And if you look at Matthew 18, you'll see that, you know, if you have a red letter Bible, you'll see that, well, Matthew 18 is almost all red letters. It's because it's a, it's a big message from Jesus. Well, last month, just, you know, to give you a bit of review, so you know where we're coming from, because I know some people had, haven't heard all these different messages. He, he was talking uh, to the disciples, his teaching focusing less and less on the crowds and the multitudes and more and more on making sure that the disciples are really prepped and ready for the events to come, that he was going to die, he wasn't going to be around all the time, and he needed them to be ready to pick up the ball and run with it in the future. So he said with, uh, with them, he talked about the bedrock and foundation of faith, you know, believing that Jesus is the son of the living God, his coming death and resurrection, which of course meant that he would soon be leaving them. And he gave them the keys of administration to manage the functions of the church, authority to make decisions about how the law would be interpreted and applied, and also talked to them about that they, they too must take up their cross, putting to death the old person and becoming a new person. And he ended that session with a promise. He promised that some of them would see him in the power and glory of the kingdom before they tasted death. Which, of course, meant that some of them wouldn't, I guess. Some of them would die, which is worth thinking about. So if you're in Matthew yet, we're going to be looking at Matthew 17. And I'd like to read Matthew 17, verses 1 through 13, if you would. And in these verses, we get a glimpse, or they got a glimpse. We just hear about it. They got a glimpse of Jesus as he will be, in certain ways, in the kingdom of God. So let's read verses 1 through 13. So after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Uh, if you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face, ground to the ground, face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The disciples asked him, Why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. So Jesus took his closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, sort of like the inner core, 
And he took them up the mountain, and while they were there, he allowed them, or they were allowed to see him in his glorified state. Which, if you think about it, if, you, you know, if you've read the whole Bible, you know that's very similar to what we read in Revelation 1. Where Jesus is there, briny, uh, shining, bright like the sun. There's more description in Revelation, but it's the same basic concept. This is glory. They're seeing something pretty spectacular. This amazing vision... I mean, why? Why do this? Just, you know, why put on a light show like that? What's the point? Well, this amazing vision would have been probably much needed assurance from the Father to strengthen Jesus himself, to give him resolve to go to Jerusalem and face crucifixion. He'd been talking to the disciples about what was up, what was coming. They weren't getting it. They knew he was headed to Jerusalem. He told them he was going to die. He knew what was involved. And we know from elsewhere that, you know, he was fully God, fully human, and the human part of him didn't want to die. So he needed that resolve. And in the vision, we uh, learn that uh, Moses and Elijah are part of the vision. They talk to him about his upcoming death, and, and we learn that little snippet of information from the parallel account in Luke 9, verse 31. Actually, I have a... I want to get something. I forgot to bring my prop. You get that kind of information with a book like this, which is uh, Harmony of the Gospels. Does anyone, ever, does anyone have a Harmony of the Gospels? Oh, man, that's better than I thought. Yeah, Harmony of the Gospels is a very useful um, way to look at the Scriptures. Let's throw in a good example where sometimes you get all... There's a good one. Parallel accounts of the same information in the Gospels. And what I've done in this case is I've taken Luke's account and I've taken some of the details and I'm putting them together with what we're reading in Matthew, just so you know, you know what I'm doing and why. So Moses and Elijah were talking to him about his upcoming death, the events that were going to take place in Jerusalem. And presumably uh, Moses and Elijah represent the law and the prophets urging him to go on, you know, move on. We also know that this cloud kind of reminds me of the Shekinah cloud in the temple comes upon them and the voice of the Father speaks, affirming, you know, Jesus is on the right path, you know, listen to him, and then it's over. Now, no doubt the memory of this was also very helpful to the disciples themselves, those who had experienced it, and would help the disciples get through the troubles and trials that the church would face after Jesus' death. And in a, in a way, for us as well, it's uh, something that we can do, probably should do, is think about the glory that awaits as a way to get through sometimes the daily grind of trials, tests, and suffering. On the way down the mountain, as they're coming down, he once again tells them not to tell anybody about what they have just experienced. And you might think, well, what's with that? I mean, aren't we supposed to you know, tell everybody about Jesus Christ? Well, where they're at is not where we're at. They didn't know the whole story. They really didn't understand everything that he was telling him them. They, he would say the words, you know, well, look, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be crucified. I'll, raise, uh, I'll be risen on the third day. Yeah, uh-huh. And they'd hear it, but they, they didn't get it. They didn't get it. Um, if you read the parallel account in Mark 9, Mark relates that they kept the matter to themselves discussing what rising from the dead meant. So he was saying this to them, and they're like, oh, yeah, oh, oh, what does that mean? So they're coming down the mountain. He says, don't talk about it yet. Well, they didn't know enough yet to go out and start telling people about the truth, telling people about Jesus. They probably would have messed up the message. And we talked about this a little bit last time, They were really still thinking of the Messiah as 
this great reformer who was going to come and overturn the governments of the world and take over and reestablish Israel and all the things that they read about and knew about in prophecy, you know, in Isaiah and Hosea and Ezekiel and all this stuff. Yeah, it's all going to happen. But Jesus said, no, wait, because they, they really didn't get yet the true work of the Messiah. For example, on the way down, they, what do they want to talk about? They want to talk about Elijah. What about Elijah? The coming Elijah, part of prophecy, you know, this is Elijah's going to come before the Messiah, and Elijah's going to restore all things, and the Messiah comes. What about that? So they're still thinking in terms of this vision, you know, or this idea of the Messiah as coming to bring about national restoration and, you know, be a conquering and victorious Messiah. And that'll come, but this was not the time. So the disciples did not really understand what Jesus was telling them about the path to glory that you know, some of them had just witnessed, that that path to glory was actually going to come through enduring trials and suffering and even persecution. They seem to be aware that he is telling them that he's establishing some sort of new community, a community of chosen ones, sort of another remnant of Israel, if you will. But how this community of chosen ones would interact with the world? Huh. I don't know that they really understood how that was all going to work. What would their status be? Are they about to become kings and priests? What will they have authority over? Who will be in charge? That's the kind of stuff they like to talk about. Well, when they get down, you can read about that in verses 14 through 23. Let's just read them first. So, so starting in verse 14, when they came to the crowd, so the four of them are coming down, they've come down the mountain. They came to the crowd. A man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I... Stay with you. How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private, and they asked, Why couldn't we drive it out? And if you remember from previous sermons, that's something that was unique about the disciples, that they would come to Jesus and say, Can you explain this to me? Can you explain this to us? Whereas the crowds would be kind of like, Cool. And then they just wander off, I guess. But the disciples came and they wanted to know, what is this all about? What does this mean? And Jesus replied, because you have so little faith, truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. As soon as Jesus and the three disciples arrived back from the mountain, they meet this large, noisy crowd. Again, that's detail that you get from some of the parallel accounts. There's a big crowd, and there's a hubbub. <clears throat> the disciples who had re- remained behind had tried to heal a demon-possessed boy, but they'd failed. And then there were scribes, and there were naysayers there disputing with the disciples, you know, and probably saying, well, ha, look, you're not as smart as you think you are. And there's all this going on. <laughs> And then the father of the boy runs up to Jesus and he says, help me. Well, I don't know about you, but first thing I think is, what a way to come down off a spiritual high. Here they are up in the mountain, they have this glorious vision, and they end up right in the middle of all this hubbub. But as always, Jesus is patient and compassionate, and he sets a perfect example of the principles of loving authority and true greatness that he is about to begin teaching at length in Matthew 18. So it's actually kind of a useful example that Matthew's put in there to show all this stuff that Jesus is going to teach about. But here, first, we see it in the way he acts, his personal example. Moving along in uh, Matthew 17, let's read verses 24 through 27. Uh, We'll skip. He predicts his death a second time, but in 24, we'll pick it up there. 
After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma temple tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon? That's Peter's other name. From whom do the kings of the earth collect duties and taxes? From their own children or from others? From others, Peter answered. Then the children are exempt, Jesus said to him. But so that we may not cause offense, go to the lake and throw out your line, take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and for yours. This is where I really appreciated the sermonette, because the question is, before we get into talking about greatness and authority and all that stuff with the church, is the church subject to worldly authority? Okay, so I actually can kind of skim through some of this because uh, we handled it already. But here in Matthew, before jumping into, again, before jumping into that main body about greatness in the kingdom of God, we have this example. Matthew records an interesting exchange with the Jews who collected the temple tax. Interesting because it makes a point about the present authority of the church. What is the authority of the church? What is its relationship to human government. Now, the temple tax was not a law recorded in the Old Testament. It was a law of the Jews, something that they had cooked up themselves. Um, They tried to base it on an obscure interpretation of Exodus 30, verse 13, but really, no, it's not biblical. It's something they did, and, you know, as authorities, they... They had the authority to tax if they wanted to. You'd think tithing would be enough, but, you know, they had a temple tax. And Jesus makes a point to Peter. And he says, basically, I'll paraphrase what I think he's saying here is, the children of God are not commanded to pay this tax. It's not required by God's law. But so as not to offend, we will pay it not to offend, to give them a reason to disregard what we say in other matters, you know, to just, you know, say, well, those people are rebels. They won't, you know, just kind of dismiss them. We'll pay it. And even though we are children of the Most High, we submit ourselves to worldly authority, as we heard about in the sermonette, except where it requires us to disobey God. Jesus has given authority to the church. Last time we read about, he gave them the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We talked about that. Yet, the church subjects itself to worldly authority, just as Jesus did. Waiting, again, as we heard in the sermonette, waiting for God's appointed time. So these are some things that happen. These are action things before we get into this long recorded sermon, if you will, in Matthew 18, verse 1. But there's one more little action point. Let's read Matthew 18, verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and they asked, who then is greatest in the kingdom of God? heaven. So now we've got the subject, authority and greatness in the kingdom of God. Kingdom of heaven is just another way of saying kingdom of God. Authority and greatness in the kingdom of God. What's it all about? Well, Jesus is about to answer that. And if you look, he spends a lot of time doing it. It's a big subject. And again, if you read parallel accounts, the disciples didn't just ask the question. They were arguing among one another. Well, who's the greatest? I'm the greatest. Oh, no, I'm the greatest. I don't know what they, what they were, you know, what was going on in their mind, but they were arguing about who's going to be the greatest. Maybe the guys who were up on the mountain thought they were hot stuff. I don't know. Now, the disciples believed that Jesus was the Messiah, that he would usher in the kingdom of God. They'd made that declaration Uh, Previously, he had talked to them about great authority about to come their way. 
They knew that he was on his way to Jerusalem for a showdown with the powers that be, that he would be killed and be miraculously resurrected to life. Three of the twelve had just seen Jesus revealed in his divine glory. It was enough to make anybody's head swim, was it not? Pretty heady stuff. Woo! Surely the time is now. It's happening. And I'm here. I'm right in the middle of it. Wow. I wonder how important I'll be in the kingdom of God. Their arguing shows that the disciples did not yet share the mind of God on matters of authority and greatness. Perhaps, speculation on my part, but perhaps even to the point of kind of looking forward to the day when they would be able to lord it over others. You know, in the name of God, of course. But I'll be in charge. And then we'll do things right. Maybe they were thinking along those lines. It's kind of how the human mind thinks. I mean, I'm making it kind of crass, but that's kind of where we settle on matters. So maybe they were kind of anticipating lording it over others, as the kings of the Gentiles do. A way of thinking that Jesus would warn the disciples about again at the final Passover. You know, it is not so. It's not to be that way with you. you know, you're supposed to be different. You can read that in Luke 22, verse 25, when they have the same dispute about who's the greatest. Whoa! Look, it's not that way with you guys, where you know the, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over others, etc. Jesus' answer to their question, "Who will be the greatest in the kingdom of God?" as I've noted, takes up the entirety of chapter 18. He first instructs them and instructs us to redefine greatness away from a focus on hierarchy, status, privilege, things like that, toward a standard based on how you treat other people. And this kingdom of God standard, if you will, was to be the standard for his church and is the standard for his church. Because not only was he talking to them about the kingdom of God that would happen in the future, but he was establishing some points and principles with them right then and there about how's the church going to run? How are you guys going to do things when I am gone? So Jesus uses two scenarios for how you treat other people. Two scenarios, and we'll kind of organize it this way. The first is a warning, or series of warnings, against offending one of the little ones. And we see that in verses 1 through 14. The second scenario that he goes through is instructions on how to deal with those who wrong you, or who do wrong themselves. That's verses 15 through 35. So the first section I'm going to break down, and that's the warning against defending the little ones. I think there are, let's see, one, two, three, four, four points on that. Humility, responsibility, self-denial, respect and kindness and concern for others. So Jesus first warns those who would be great against offending other people. Let's read Matthew 18 and verses 2 through 4. They've just asked the question, and the first thing he does is he called a little child to him. And he placed the child among them, and he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like this little child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore... Whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Actually, I didn't mean to read verse 5, but that's okay. You have to change. You have to change your way of thinking. That's what he's saying. You have to change. Unless you change. Change your way of thinking. Consider this. If the word of God who was with God, who was God, if the word of God was willing to empty himself of all that glory 
You can read about this in Philippians 2. And come in the form of a working class carpenter humbling himself throughout the course of his life in obedience even unto death. If the word of God is willing to humble himself that way, what does that mean for us and how we should humble ourselves? Those who are to follow in his footsteps, the church of God. The things that he did, the example that he set, has some big implications for us and how we think and how we act. Children. He uses the example of children. Well, children don't naturally act humble. Sorry. They just don't. I've had children. They're not naturally humble. Uh, They are totally all about me. That's what kids are like. They're not acting humble. But they are humble. They are of lowly status. Right? As he says, unless you make yourself of lowly position as a child. Children are humble, of lowly status, utterly dependent on their parents, not self-sufficient at all. And likewise, we must realize that we are completely dependent. Completely dependent. We, you, me, have no power whatsoever to save ourselves from death. None. Show me the person who has the power to save themselves from death. We don't have that. That's what we want, but we have no means to get it on our own. Completely dependent. We are 100% dependent on the mercy of our Father in heaven. We must turn away from preoccupation with status hierarchy, prestige, and humble ourselves as if we were a child. So so we don't want to act like children, but we take that lowly position in our minds, in our hearts, and in our actions. And we must trust our Father. So how does this affect human relationships, this lowliness of mind? How does that affect human relationships? Well, hopefully you already know the answer and you're already leaping ahead of me because you've heard this before. I think the answer is simple, though. How does this affect human relationships? Well, those who think highly of themselves tend to treat others as lowly. It's a, you know, kind of just a really simple equation. If I think I'm hot stuff, naturally that means you're not or at least not as you know, hot stuff as me. You're lower. It's just the way we are. It's the way we think. So those who think highly of themselves tend to treat others as lowly. A scenario with great potential to be a stumbling block for others in the church. Have you ever met anyone who's arrogant and full of themselves? Yeah, people like that mess you up. Yeah, well, if that's what people are like in God's church, I don't want anything to do with it. You know, if that's, you know, if that's what you link together with the truth of God, then, oh. That brings us to our next point, which is responsibility. Matthew 18, verses 5 through 7. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. So it's a personal, very personal responsibility that each and every one of us bear. You are responsible for the effect you have on the spiritual lives of other people. Responsibility. It's it's actually a pretty heavy responsibility. You are responsible for the effect that you have on other people in the church. Outside the church as well, but primarily we're focused on internal matters here. That's what Christ is focusing on with the disciples. He says, those who believe in me. He's talking about the brotherhood, if you will. The sisterhood, peoplehood, I don't know what to call it, the church. 
So on the positive side, we have the potential to impact people, welcoming newcomers who hear and obey our Father in Heaven, welcoming the, the little children that come to God. But on the negative side, as we just read, God is very displeased with those who mess up the spiritual lives of others. Woe to them. And he's actually very, you know, Jesus is very graphic about it. He's got this image of I'm tying this giant rock to your neck and throwing you in the ocean. Bad, bad, bad. So God is very displeased with that kind of stuff. Now, if you're reading the New King James or the NIV, you probably read the phrase cause to sin. All right? So if anyone causes one of these little ones to sin, okay, that's probably what you read. If you're reading the old King James, you would read to stumble or to offend, to offend. But in the new King James and the NIV, you read uh, cause to sin. All right? I had a big sheet. I decided not to print it out because it actually got kind of complicated, but I had this whole sheet where all the instances of this word were in there. It, to, I think it's a dubious translation, and I'm reading actually from the NIV uh, 2011 version, and they've gone back to stumble because that's really a better translation for it. The word here is scandalizo, scandalizo, the word we get scandal from, which is usually translated, if you look at the other scriptures, and just at Matthew, that word scandalizo is usually translated offend, uh, to, be, to offend someone, to offend dead, but also to, to cause to fall away, to cause to stumble, trip up, mess up. So it's an important word. It's not really talking about sin, per se. It's talking about messing people up, causing problems in their spiritual lives, causing doubt, making them wonder, is this really what it's all about? Things that we can do, things we do, well, they can have a real impact on people. Very often the result of someone being offended, if you will, is that they fall away. Is it not? They fall away. They leave the faith. They leave the church. How do we avoid that? We don't want that to happen, right? As Jesus said, woe unto them who cause this stuff to happen. It's bad news. So that's personal responsibilities there. What do we do about it? How do we avoid that? Well, that brings us to our next point, self-denial. Matthew 18, verses 8 and 9. Jesus goes on to say, If your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Destroy it forever. Self-denial. If there are parts of our personalities, your personality, my personality, that cause stumbling, offense, falling away, you must get rid of them. You must deal with it as part of your responsibility. What kind of stuff are we talking about? Well, pretty, you know, we know all this stuff already. Vanity, pride, love of gossip, playing fast and loose with God's commands, wrangling over the minutia of Scripture, lording it over other people, coldness, Indifference, etc. I can go on. You know, Paul does a good job of making lists like that. Peter does it a few times. These have a very negative effect on others and on you. So it affects others, but it also affects you. It affects me when I do that badly. And this is what Jesus means. Or, you know, when we looked at the last sermon, this is what he's talking about when he says, whoever loses his life for me will find it. To put to death those things that are in you and in your life, you know, you have to put them to death and move on to be crucified with Christ. That's what it's talking about. Put those things to death and move on into the 
newness of life. That's what he's talking about. Lose your life, you know, because sometimes that, I mean, vanity and pride are a perfect example. That's me. That's what I'm all about. To put that to death is painful, but it has to happen. And, you know, there's a longer list there. Maybe you're not a proud or vain person, but you potentially could be one of the other things. So it's your walk with God. It's you working out your own salvation. I can't tell you. I mean, I can't cover every individual in the congregation. I just picked one that was real easy. (laughs) All right, my fourth in this first section is respect, kindness, and concern for others. Let's read uh, verses 10 through 14. Jesus goes on to say, See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What did you think? What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hill and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. And in the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. Care for the individual members and not just the flock. And actually, Mr. Jenkins kind of touched on this. Uh, He did it in, in a different way, but the same concept. Care for the individual and not just for the flock. What does that mean? Well, I think it's if you're focused on the concept instead of the reality. Uh, I used to love reading the cartoons in the newspaper. I don't really anymore because I don't get a newspaper. And I remember this really funny one. It was about this, it was kind of philosophical, but there was this guy who was a philosophical type character, kind of like um, Calvin and Hobbes, that kind of thing. And in it, he said, well, I love, Humanity. I just don't like people very much. And that is so true. If you think about that, to me, that's one of the nuggets of my life. I've probably read this 30 years ago and I stuck with it. Yeah, I love humanity. It's just people, you know, they're kind of a pain. Get on my nerves. Very true. Think about that. Dwell on it. I have for 30 years. Um, What good is it to say, I love the brethren, conceptually. Or I respect the brethren, in theory. But not to love or respect the individual members that you come across, that you rub shoulders with, that you bump into coffee with at church, that you have over to your homes, hopefully. Now, remember, Jesus is talking to the disciples the founding members of his church. He uses words like those who believe, the brothers, you know, those who are together in this thing. He's talking to the disciples who would be the founding members of his church if we, you know, follow the narrative through Acts unto today. The church follows in Jesus' footsteps, and he's setting the ball rolling here or kind of getting it ready to roll. These are the people who would be the founding members of his church. And he's answering their question about who will be the greatest in the kingdom of God. And the answer is greatness was to be measured in their treatment of others, especially of the little ones, the small, the weak, the naive. You see this same concern, even in the Old Testament. What do the prophets talk about? They talk about people who have power taking advantage of people who don't. Isn't that the theme of the prophets? All throughout God's word, there is a focus on people who are in charge, people who have authority, people who are strong, people who are powerful, people who are blessed, whatever your thing is, that you don't use that as a way to lord it over other people and take advantage of them. That's one of the big themes of the Bible. So I said there were two major areas that Jesus talked about. How you deal with people to not offend them. 
And then the second section, we'll get into that. Jesus now addresses our treatment of those who have done wrong or done wrong to us. Let's take a look at Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, take it to the church, and if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Another kind of harsh reality that Jesus gets into. Note the use of the word brother and sister again. Okay, This is directed towards relationships in the church. I think they are good principles, and you can practice them to people outside the church, and I think you will have good results. But we're primarily focused on how do you people treat each other, you who are my called and chosen people? How are you going to treat each other? You want to be great in the kingdom of God? You want to be a king and a priest? How are you trained for it? Also, the word translated as sin here, if a brother or sister sins against you. This is not that word we used before, like if you're reading the New King James or the NIV. It's not scandalizio. This word is harmatano. Harmatano or harmatia, something like that. I'm, you know, I'm not a Greek scholar or anything, but I did look it up, and it's a different word. Harmartano which truly does mean sin. We're talking about sin here. We're not talking about offense. We're not talking about gossip or hurting people's feelings or anything like that. We're talking about sin, someone who's done wrong. Okay? We're not talking about things that cause doubt or offense, falling away. We're talking about someone who has done wrong, done you wrong. Now, some people are hypersensitive. You all know there's people like that. They're just really hypersensitive. And they find offense everywhere they turn. Okay? And that happens. But that's not what we're talking about here. You looked at me the wrong way. I don't like the way you poured that coffee. You had an attitude when you did that. I didn't like the tone of your email. I'm offended. That's not what we're talking about here. Sometimes people have quarrels. And usually in a quarrel, I'm almost always in a quarrel, both parties share in the blame. That's not what we're talking about here either. This is a trespass, a sin, where the fault is on the other side. Okay? Pretty cut and dry. So if a brother or sister sins against you, then he goes through a progressive program of how to deal with them. Now, I think this is a great time for a question, a rhetorical question, if you will. Isn't it better to overlook the sin? to forgive and forget, to turn the other cheek? Isn't it better to do that? Isn't that really what Jesus taught? To forgive? I think we get a lot of that in our society right now, and I don't think it's bearing good fruit. Forgiveness is too often used as a disguise for weakness and indifference in the face of sin. Notice the phrase in here also, you have won your brother. If they listen to you, you have won them over. You have won your brother. You have gained your brother if you're reading the King James. The motive here is not to be correct or prove yourself right or to punish. The motive here is to restore a fellow disciple. Right? To restore a fellow disciple. Where are you coming from? You're doing this to help the person. Not to score brownie points with God, make yourself feel better. Now, when a person repents, forgiveness is available, as we see. But without repentance, forgiveness is not given, as we just read. I think this is a time for another question. Hmm, okay. But Christ extended forgiveness to people who had not repented. Did he not? Many times. Why? How come he can do it and I can't? 
Well, because the people that Christ forgave didn't know any better. They didn't know. They didn't have the truth. This instruction is to the church. This instruction is to people who do know better. Through the presence of God's Holy Spirit in you, you should not only know it, but do it and feel it in your heart and in your mind. And because of that, because these instructions are geared towards the brotherhood, forgiveness is handled a little bit differently. And forgiveness, I think, is one of those concepts that has just been beaten to a pulp in our society so that it's completely meaningless. Forgiveness doesn't mean I just walk the other way, ignore, don't pay attention to, or am indifferent indifferent to what's going on. Christ's instruction is a simple four-point plan. Now, the first three steps all, if you think about it, are opening up the door for repentance. First, you go to the person alone. You, you talk to them alone. You know, repentance, the door is open. Two, you go to them with reliable people as witnesses, two or three. The door for repentance is open. Three, you take it to the church. Now, I mean, this is kind of escalating, but at this point you hope that they will submit to authority and judgment, but the door to repentance is open. Four, You excommunicate the person. Important point. Forgiveness is withheld where there is no repentance. It's an equation. It's an important equation. There's no repentance. Forgiveness is handled differently. Let's take a look at Matthew 18 and verses 18 through 20. He says to them, Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree with about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. I forgot to tell you about the subpoints in this second section, the second section being addressing how people have done us wrong. Uh, the first that we just went through was um, discipline. So we looked at the four-step plan. I was sorry I should have given that to you in advance. Discipline. The next is unity and then forgiveness. So unity is what we're talking about here in Matthew 18, verses 18 through 20. Christ has given the church authority to discipline. No doubt. It's hard to deny. These are the teachings of Christ. This is what we're trying to pull out of Matthew. What did Christ teach people? What is he teaching us? What did Christ teach? Focusing less on what he did. What did he say? Christ has given the church authority to discipline. However, discipline administered in the name and the authority of Christ must be administered in the spirit of Christ as well. It's like, it's like one of those things, you know, which, you'll hear me say this a lot now, which wing on the airplane is the most important? Well, you need them both. You're going to administer discipline in the name and authority of Christ. You have to do it in the spirit of Christ, or else you're just a hypocrite, or maybe not a hypocrite, half-wit? I don't know. <laughs> The Spirit of Christ, and here the part of the Spirit, I think there's a lot we could talk about, is unity of mind and purpose. Unity of mind and purpose. An important point, again, going back to the sermonette. This is not something that is done at the whim of a powerful individual, a dictator, an overlord, whatever, someone who thinks they're the greatest in the kingdom of God even. That's not how it's supposed to work. Not how it's going to work at all. Only with this kind of unity. And that's why, you know, step two, step three, you take witnesses, you take it to the church. We need to be in agreement on this. That's how we work. That's how we do things. Do we go off the rails sometimes? Yep. But those are the rails. So we'll just focus on the rails today, okay? 
Unity of mind and purpose, not the whim of a powerful individual. And only with this kind of unity do we have any confidence that our decisions are acceptable to the Father. Uh, I think these verses require a little caveat, which is the principle, if you think about it in context, relates to matters of reconciliation. Not, not meant to be applied to matters of law or doctrine. Um, you know, we can't gather together and have a quorum and decide to change God's law. That's not what he's talking about at all. That's just, that's a no-go. It does not mean that we can gather together, you know, because there's two or three or four or five or six of us and we're all praying earnestly. It doesn't mean we get whatever we want. That's not what it's saying at all. The context is unity of mind and purpose in relationship to discipline, if you think about the context. Okay? Let's read on. The next section would be forgiveness. Forgiveness and restoration. Worthy of an entire sermon in and of itself. And we'll do that later. Verses 21 and 22. Then Peter came to Jesus and he asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Time. As they say, uh, in some versions I've read 77 times seven. But that's basically he's giving him this huge number. Based on the record, and we just read through it, Jesus uh, actually never mentioned forgiveness. He didn't talk about forgiveness. He didn't use the word forgiveness, but it was clearly implied. And Peter realizes this, and he has a question. He has this question about the limits of forgiveness. Hmm, how many times do I have to do that? Now, the cultural context, I think, comes into play here. Traditionally, the rabbis of the day, the teachers of law, teachers of righteousness and things like that, they had a three strikes and you're out policy. That's basically how, how it ran. That would be what the disciples were used to. Three strikes and you're out. All right, I'm going to go to you once. I'm going to go to you twice. I'm going to go to you a third time. You get three, you know, I'll, you sinned once, you repented, good. You sinned the second time. I'm going to do it again. You did it again, I'm going to go to you. But then you're, then you're toast. Three strikes and you're out. So I think Peter probably thought, hmm, I'm going to be real generous. I'm going to double the number, add one to boot. Now that, that's generous. Seven, three times two plus one. I'm going to double that, add one more for good measure, seven times. Jesus replies to him and says, no, that's not what we're talking about. Forgiveness is basically unlimited. You just don't have a limit on forgiveness. Always forgive unless the person refuses to repent. Which, if you know what repent means, also implies a change of behavior. Right? A change of behavior. But if there is no repentance, as we saw in that four-step thing that Jesus laid out, if there's no repentance, then the principles of verses 15 through 17 come back into play. Treat that person as a, you know, just, no, sorry, you're, don't come back. You're out. But always the door is open where repentance is present. Unlimited forgiveness is available from God where there is repentance. Very important equation. Something that we get wrong all the time. What is forgiveness without repentance? I'm not going to answer that. I just want you to think about it. What is forgiveness without repentance? What purpose does it serve? And where does it lead you? Jesus ends this section that he's teaching with a parable. And that's verses 20, 23 through 35. Let's just read that. He says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. 
And at this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. Not a lot. He grabbed him and he began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant, note fellow servant, fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servants just as I had on you? And in his anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and sister from your heart. (coughs) So a parable of forgiveness. For those who repent, those who beg the Master, forgive me, who repent, God eternally and unconditionally forgives a huge debt, 10,000 bags of gold, And it's, so it's hard to understand. And I don't know if it's hard for God to understand, but it's hard to understand believers, fellow servants who would refuse to grant forgiveness to each other over matters that are trivial in comparison to the mountain of debt that God has forgiven us. A handful of coins as opposed to 10,000 bags of gold. Once again, the implications of what Jesus did, the work of the Messiah, his death, his resurrection, his life, are big, all-consuming, if you will. By accepting God's unlimited forgiveness of us through the blood of Jesus Christ, forgiving us, forgiving our sins, we are therefore expected to extend that same forgiveness to others. That's how it works. That's what walking in the way is all about. That's what following in Jesus' footsteps is all about. Not just from the lip, as we read here, but from the heart. If you've had kids and you ask them to apologize, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about there. You need to apologize to your sister. I apologize. That's from the lip, not from the heart. Okay? Not from the heart. Who will be who would be the greatest in the kingdom of God? That's the question, right? That's the question. That's the theme. Who would be the greatest in the kingdom of God? One who learns humility is sober minded about their responsibility towards others, is ready to put away anything in themselves that causes harm is respectful, kind, and concerned about others, is willing to apply discipline when necessary, works together in unity with their brothers, and is eager and wants to forgive the repentant person. That's the answer to the question, who will be the greatest in the kingdom of God?